Romans chapter 3 tonight. What'd you say? Romans chapter 10. You said, you said the righteousness of God and the righteousness of man. I figured that's where you'd be. Romans chapter 10. 3 or 10? Sorry, 3. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Jedi mind trick. He's weak minded. <laughs> Timothy 2.15 tells you the exact method of Bible study. That's almost after you're done reading the whole book. <laughs> Why does God give you the key to how to study His Word at the end of it? Seek him. If you're diligently seeking him, you'll eventually get there. And in the last days, there will be many that will turn from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. <clears throat> study, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's like I was talking about this morning. Most of you people here tonight would know who I was talking about if I'd say their name, but I'm not going to say their name. I'm just telling you this so uh, I can uh, uh, mention the attitude of men who not only fail to, but refuse to rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, when a man will confront you and tell you what you teach is wrong, and then when you turn to a scripture and begin to show him something out of it, and he absolutely refuses to even look down at the scripture, What's his problem? Well, like we mentioned this morning, he's not under authority to the Word of God. That's what his problem is. He's under the authority of his own mind and his own understanding. That's why those certain scriptures in the Bible that he'll refuse to address. Why? Because it don't coincide with his doctrine. We have to bring our doctrine in line with the scriptures and not the scriptures in line with our doctrine. And the reason God put that in the toward the end of the Bible, telling you how to study your Bible, is because he takes the fool, the wise man, in their own conceits. He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And the weak things to confound the things that are mighty. What impresses man don't impress God. Right. As a matter of fact, you take man's popular viewpoint on an issue, and I can guarantee you 9.99999 times out of every 10, God's on the totally opposite side of that issue. Right. I mentioned this here Wednesday night, people think when I mention it, I'm just joking. Go read Psalm chapter 2. And you see where God talks about the kings of the earth taking counsel against him and against his anointed, which is Jesus Christ. Right. And the Bible says that those men that take counsel, God will laugh at them. He'll mock them. They're making him split his side. Right. A bunch of futile, fragile men who's going to end up in a hole in the ground with maggots and worms eating the flesh off of their bone, a bunch of men who can't 
hold a little flame that's only that big out of a cigarette lighter next to their skin for more than one and a half seconds without doing this are going to get in a big room and try to bring about things that they want without the counsel of God. Peace. Right. right. No war. It ain't going to happen. This is where they're seated. These are some words God uses to describe these men. Do you know God could have described them as without godliness, without, un, without holiness, without righteousness, and he'd have been saying the same thing about them. But God in his infinite wisdom with a mastery of every language on planet earth decided to call them ungodly, unholy, unrighteous, unthankful. And then they get in a big room and decide that they're going to take counsel against God up in New York City and not even give Him any credit. Amen. This is my authority. Amen. But we've been talking about God's righteousness and personal righteousness. The biggest issue you will find with people is getting them to simply acknowledge that there's a difference in these two things right here. Is there a difference in my unrighteousness and God's righteousness? Amen. <laughs> you better believe there is. Romans chapter 3. I'm hoping to finish this up tonight so we can move on to another part of this study. Look at Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 21. What do you immediately think when you read those first two words there? Present. Now. Something took place now that wasn't true before. Yeah. But now, meaning it's true now and it wasn't before the but That's right. came along. That's all I'm <laughs> if I tell you I was driving 50 miles per hour, but now I'm driving 55, it's all the same. Yeah, it's all the same. <laughs> 50, 55, it's all the same. 70, it says, but now the righteousness of God, God's righteousness, the righteousness of God, without the law, is manifested. That word manifest means made known. What Paul's telling us here is that there's a time now where the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God without the law is now manifested. It's now made known. Meaning prior to this, it was not made known. Regardless of what all these guys that want to tell you they had the same salvation in the Old Testament that we have today, they're wacky. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Let me point out something to you in that verse. Something very important out of that verse. Verse 22. Do you see the, the faith of Jesus Christ and your own personal faith in that verse? Yes. And that believe. There's the faith of Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ's faith. 
And it's to all them that believe. That's our faith. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission, notice this, of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the, the deeds of the law. So now turn back to chapter 1. Let me, uh, let me make two quick points. <clears throat> Uh, there in verse 21 where it says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Okay, you go back to Luke. and In Luke's introduction in the first chapter, he introduces a priest by the name of Zacharias and his wife, Elizabeth. Uh, and verse 6 of the first chapter says, they were both righteous before God. Yeah walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. But now that righteousness is manifested without the law. And uh, uh, there in verse 25 of Romans chapter 3 where it says that uh, to declare His righteousness for the remission of of sins that are past. Now, a lot of people think when they get saved, just their past sins are forgiven. Just their past sins are remitted. But what they don't realize that in the context of this chapter, it says there in verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh justified in his sight even though Zacharias and Elizabeth were considered righteousness, righteous by walking in the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, there had still at that point not been a sacrifice offered to take away sin. So when it's talking here about the sins that are past, it's talking about people like Zacharias and Elizabeth it's talking about people like King David, the prophets. It's talking about all those Old Testament saints who had not had their sins taken away. But when Jesus died, that one sacrifice was then able to take away the sins that were past. And that's how you rightly divide the word of truth. Yeah, I'm getting there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel of Christ. The power of God unto salvation. This is a gospel he's talked about of salvation. You couple that verse there in Romans 1 with Ephesians 1.13 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The gospel of salvation is the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. So I think Acts 26 or Acts 20, the gospel of the grace of God. They're all the same. But the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. In verse 17, there in Romans 1, he says, For therein is the righteousness. What are we talking about? The righteousness of God. Therein in the gospel of the death, 
burial, and resurrection is the righteousness of God revealed. Amen. Amen. The righteousness of God is revealed in the death burial. Let me tell you something. The righteousness of God is not revealed in you coming to an altar and deciding, I'm, 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 I'm tired of my life turning out a mess. I'm going to promise God I'm going to try to do a lot better and He's going to forgive me and send me on a new path. That's not where the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed in the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. Amen. We looked at it this morning in uh, Romans chapter 4. Paul says in verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Right. Amen. I don't believe in a God that helps me be a little better version of myself. <laughs> I believe in a God that if He's going to justify me, He's going to have to justify an ungodly sinner. Right. Amen. <clears throat> a man who can't even attempt, attempt, let alone achieve anything that will be pleasing to Him, I can't even attempt to please God with my speech, with my actions, with my treatment of others, with my worship, with my praise of Him. I'm an ungodly sinner. Amen. That's right. The righteousness of God is revealed. Words are important. In Romans chapter 1, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You chase that word salvation through your Bible and see where other places that Paul used it, namely Ephesians 1.13 and 1 Corinthians 15, if it's not the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. Right. And it's that. It's right there where the righteousness of God is revealed. Amen. Paul says that there, verse chapter 1, verse 17. For therein, where? The gospel of Christ. Where the power of God unto salvation is at. Where it's to everyone that believeth. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It was not until... Jesus Christ showed up and died on the cross that man could truly understand the righteousness of God. Till then it wasn't truly known. That's why Paul said over there in Romans 3, we just looked at it. He said, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Till then it wasn't truly known. Has God ever uh, considered telling a lie? Well then, did a commandment that said, Thou shalt not lie, reveal the righteousness of God? To a certain extent, but God's never even had to consider not telling a lie. That was for man's righteousness. It was man's commandment. Righteousness. When we're talking about God's righteousness, and personal righteousness. What is righteousness? To be right. Huh? To be right. To be right. That's righteousness. And it has nothing to do with rosy cheek or feminine business either. <laughs> righteousness is to be right. That word means meeting the standard of what is right and just. What is the standard of what's right and just? God's standard. Yeah. Not ours. Mankind seems to
to think that if it meets their version of uh, what's right or standard of what's right, then it must be okay with God. No, that's not true at all. Right. That's not even close to being true. I was teaching one time, and just out of nowhere, somebody decided to interrupt my lesson and <coughs> throw some uh, uh, vague question at me about uh, if God said, Thou shalt not kill, and then later on he told the Israelites to go kill a bunch of people, why did he do that? Because he's God. <laughs> If he said don't kill here and then over here he said kill, guess what? Both of them's right. Why? Because he's God. And then he, he gave the answer in Ecclesiastes, there is a time to kill. Yeah. We don't decide when that time is. We just get the time wrong. 99% <laughs> yeah. of the time. He's right all the time. Yeah, and he's right all the time. Righteousness is meeting the standard of what is right and just. What's just? Just means morally right. Justify. That's a word. That's a Bible word. You want to be able to tell unscriptural preachers? See how many scriptural words they use. Let me tell you a phrase you won't find in your Bible. Your best life now. Amen. Or coping. Huh? Or coping. Or coping. Community sharing here. <laughs> but justified is a biblical word. It means to pronounce free from blame or guilt. If you don't have righteousness, you're not free of blame or guilt. God cannot justify you if you don't have righteousness. Right. He's got to pronounce you guilty. <clears throat> Or he's got to assign blame. So to justify means to pronounce free from blame or guilt. What Dad was talking about earlier. Turn to the Gospel of Luke. certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth and they were both what? Righteous. Righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. I want you to look at that word right there. See that word? Blame. Remember the word justify? To pronounce free from blame or guilt. Why is this important? Because Romans 3.28, we just read, it says, Therefore we conclude that by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But James 2.24 says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now what are you going to do with those? One mode of uh, uh, being justified or not be receiving any uh, blame or guilt is by faith without the deeds of the law. The other one is by the deeds of the law and not faith only. But here in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, we see that Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous before God because they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord and were blameless. Now turn to Philippians chapter 3.
Here's Paul giving himself, giving a, a description of himself. And starting in verse uh, 5. In the first four verses there, you learn a lesson about not having any confidence in your flesh. And if Paul, if anybody had uh, reason to be confident in their flesh, if anybody in the state of West Virginia has confidence in their flesh, I guarantee you the Apostle Paul had ten times more reason to be confident in their flesh than they do. Yeah. Why? Well, he was circumcised the eighth day, exactly how the law said. He was of the stock of Israel. I doubt there's a, you probably find some Jewish communities in West Virginia, but not many of them, especially running around in these uh, hillbilly churches in southern West Virginia. They, wouldn't, they definitely wouldn't know what tribe they came from. Yeah, they wouldn't know what tribe they came from, like him, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, meaning if you had 100 Hebrews, you'd probably pick him out as a Hebrew above the other 99. That's how much he stood out as touching the law of Pharisee. He was a fundamentalist. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. Notice that. What's he say? Same thing we just read in Luke chapter 1. Blameless. Blameless. <clears throat> Paul got his from the law. According to the written law, Paul was blameless. But notice what he says. I want to lay out the difference in these two right here. Clear as day. But what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Right there in that verse, we see Paul's own personal righteousness and the righteousness of God. Paul's own personal righteousness was of the law. God's righteousness that Paul had was by faith. That I make anything up. Are they both clear in that verse? Pretty clear. Are you going to say anything else about the book of James? I don't know, Dad. I mind. <laughs> Why? Well, I just wanted to point out that there appears to be a contradiction in the Bible. James says there in chapter 2, verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Okay, so that's promoting works. <clears throat> the works of the law is what James is promoting. But if you look at the first verse in the book of James, it tells you who James is writing to. And this is so very important to rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to know who, what, when, where, how, and why. James is writing there to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. James is a book written to the Jews who will miss the rapture and go through the tribulation. And it's the works of the law and the faith of Jesus Christ that will get them through the tribulation. And in the tribulation, it will take both for them to become justified 
in the sight of God. And so many people want to take the book of James and apply it to the church, and it's not to the church, it's to the 12 tribes, and that's Israel, that's the Jews. Plain and simple. Not hard to figure out. No, people read it as if James says, you see then how that God can only justify a man by works, yeah. not by faith only. Paul or James, neither one said anything like that. They're pointing out methods of justification. <coughs> Murder can be justified. They're also speaking of two different examples from the life of Abraham. Right. And they don't understand the purpose of Israel. And they don't understand that Israel hasn't been done away. Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Verse 22 again, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. That's not talking about the blood of Christ. He just gave you the context that he was talking about the blood of bulls and goats and calves. Remission means an act of refraining from, exacting, or calling for. The sacrifices in the Old Testament did not reveal God's righteousness. It simply allowed God to refrain from calling for what He required. Right. That's all. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, we see, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. The blood that gave remission or allowed God to refrain for calling for what He required could not take away sin. That's what we just read. God requires sinless perfection. So every year they were reminded of sin. They were reminded of sin year after year. This year they had to give a sacrifice. They came back the following year they had to give a sacrifice. The following year they had to give a sacrifice, a sacrifice, a sacrifice, a sacrifice, a sacrifice. Year after year after year after year after year. Why? Because those sacrifices cannot make those people perfect. Right. Why? Because it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Right. Amen. Romans 1.18 we see that the same place where the righteousness of God is revealed, the wrath of God is revealed. I've been teaching uh, on uh, Thursday nights to the kids. I've been trying to just bombard them with Romans, stuff from Romans. Why? Because I want them to see that they're sinners. That's why. So that they'll truly want to be saved. Man ain't gonna be want to be saved if he sees himself as okay, no. right, or decent. 
or having a chance. A man's only going to cry out to God and throw himself and submit himself to the righteousness of God when he sees himself as totally hopeless. Amen. <clears throat> but the wrath of God is revealed in the gospel of Christ. That same gospel, that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that shows us God's righteousness also shows us God's wrath. Why? Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God's revealed. Well, I told him on Thursday night, you want to know the example of the wrath of God that no man can get out of? Do you not pay attention to the cemeteries? Mankind has a funny way of dealing with his uh, reality. We can just drive and we can just, just be driving up the road past cemetery after cemetery after cemetery after cemetery. We know everybody we've ever loved is going to end up there. We're going to end up there. Our next generation is going to end up there. Three generations before us ended up there. Uh, two generations from us is going to end up there. Three generations from us is going to end up there. And we just drive and put it in the back of our heads pretend like everything's okay. What are some things that reveal the wrath of God to us? God told you the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What's the truth? That God's revealed His wrath. That's the truth. You want to know some things that reveals God's wrath? History. Yeah. I want to look, let's look at these real quick. Jude. Book of Jude. The last book before Revelation. Which is the last book in your Bible. I think one great example in our recent history is Nazi Germany. Them people went... This is what happened to the people in Nazi Germany in a 15 year span. They went from their money being so worthless that they were pushing wheelbarrows full of it to buy a loaf of bread. They were emptying out their savings account, dumping all their money in a wheelbarrow, pushing it down to the store and buying one loaf of bread with their life savings. They went from that, about five years later, they were probably the most prosperous nation on planet Earth with the most powerful military machine that anybody had ever even fathomed up to that point in history. Was possibly more powerful than any army on Earth at the time. If England and the uh, United States and your the other your uh, France and Russia Russia hadn't just ganged up on them, they probably would have conquered the earth. <clears throat> but because Hitler started taking the Jews and decided I got an oven for them, I'm going to wipe them out. God wiped him out, and he wiped Nazi Germany out. Amen. And when the war was over, you could go through Germany, and it looked like somebody just went in there and just let off an atomic bomb. They carved a bomb that place. By the time the United States and Russia got done, there was nothing left. All that happened in 15 years. That's recent history. But he says here in Jude, Jude verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You want an example of God? Don't play around Sodom and Gomorrah. Another example of God's wrath is found in Romans 13. Yep. I'm going to lead you there if you didn't go. <laughs> uh -huh. 
not as good on the day as it used to be. Lowe's, you want to see the wrath of God in Romans 13, verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Say that word wrath. Another revelation of God's wrath is in government. Right government. <coughs> that executes judgment. There's, I mean, even <coughs> though our government's corrupt, you still have good reason to be afraid of doing evil. Go out here and kill somebody and see if you don't have reason to be afraid of them. They're going to come arrest you and put you on trial. And if you find they find you guilty, they're going to lock you up for the rest of your life. Or kill you. Yep, or kill you. Another uh, revelation of God's wrath, Romans 2. Conscience. Your conscience is a revelation of God's wrath. Romans 2, 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law... These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You want a good example of uh, the wrath of God, a revelation of the wrath of God? Catch a four-year-old kid doing something he ain't supposed to and ask him who did it. And see if his conscience don't get the best of him if he don't lie. Why? Because he's got a conscience. And that conscience is accusing him. Another revelation of the wrath of God is the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. And then a fifth and final one that I got here is the Holy Spirit. John 16. <clears throat> when He has come, the Holy Spirit, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on Me. Of righteousness, because I go to My Father and you see Me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. All these things, history, government, conscience, the cross of Christ, the Holy Spirit, all of these are revelations of God's wrath and they're revelations from heaven. Uh, John 16, what? Verse 11, or 9 to 11. What are we talking about? We're talking about righteousness. Romans 3.10 As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. So we have a dilemma. How can God be just and declare unrighteous men righteous? What's just? Remember we just talked about what just means? It means meeting the standard of what is right. It means meeting the standard of what is morally right. That's what just is. So how can God meet the standard, His own standard, of what is morally right and declare immoral men morally right? Because He's right. If God, if I stand before God on judgment day and God says, you've never told a lie, guess what God just did? Lied. He lied. 
He didn't meet the standard of what's right. So how can we? How can God do that? How can He? How can a righteous God just uh, uh, declare unrighteous men free of guilt through the gospel of Christ? That's where God, the righteousness of God, is revealed. Which brings me back to Romans chapter three, back to verse twenty-one. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, there's a righteousness of God which is without law. It's totally apart from this one here, which is by the law. This one has nothing to do with this one. That's what it says. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. After Christ died on this cross, now you can see God's righteousness. You couldn't see it before this. Remember we done talked about that's where the righteousness of God was revealed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. You couldn't see it before that. You couldn't see the righteousness of God before that. After Christ died on the cross men can now see God's righteousness. God's righteousness without the law is manifested through the cross of Christ. The law and the prophets were simply witnesses of this righteousness. Amen. Verse 22 there, it's by faith of, of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. This righteousness of God is revealed through the cross by faith of Jesus Christ. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. This here is very important in the context of what we're talking about. Is there a difference in this? seminary education. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? Yes. Faith in Christ, faith of Christ. Huge. Huge difference. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The faith of Christ. God is so righteous that when He showed up on earth as a man, He did everything that He required of Himself. That's how righteous He is. Where do we see this? We see it in the garden right before He died. He had a struggle there in the garden between his own will and God's will. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this pass cut, this cut pass for me, but not my will, but thy holy will be. Right? Is that what he said? What was his will? His will was for that cut to pass. Well, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I can't believe you'd say such a thing. 
Is anybody in here that would want to be be close to death, have your beard plucked out by the handful, spit on, laughed at, mocked, slapped, beat up, pummeled in the face, nailed to a cross, and then while you're dying there naked for all the world to see, doing it for the whole world, men walk by and laugh at you. But he was totally submitted to the will of God. Amen. <clears throat> this faith and this righteousness is unto all and upon all them that believe there is no difference all have sinned come short of the glory of God because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God we must be justified or pronounced free from guilt by God's grace totally and without exception. What does the word grace mean? It means goodwill or favor. We've got to be justified, declared free of guilt simply because of God's goodwill or favor. It's a favor from God. Amen. I'm just going to do you a favor. Why are you going to do me a favor, God? Just because you're pitiful and I feel sorry for you. No other reason. Oh, one other reason. Because I love myself so much that I'm going to do it for my own glory. I want you to thank me for the next eternity. Yeah, I'm going to do it for you so that you can spend all of eternity thanking me and telling everybody else how great I am. Amen. God wants to do us a favor, but He can only do it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means a state of being regained, the state of being a regained possession by a paid, specified sum. All have sinned. We must be justified freely. We can through God.